the greatest road rally in North America. The 2014 Hemmings Boner News Great Race presented by Haggerty. 104 teams rallied for nine days, traveling 2,400 miles from Maine to Florida, all for a piece of the $150,000 prize money. It is the craziest, most bizarre thing you will ever hear about in classic car rallies that is the funnest, most exciting, best time of your life. This type of endurance driving is a test to the driver's limits, not only in open cockpit cars, but with roadside and overnight repairs, it really is a time speed endurance rally. When the straight race is kind of tough on cars, we have axles break, we have brakes that wear out, we change engines at night, so it is a time speed endurance rally hard on drivers, also it's hard on vintage cars. Get ready for a one-of-a-kind road rally adventure as we travel through the back roads of America on the 2014 Hemmings Motor News Great Race presented by Haggerty. Great Race was started in 1983 by Tom McRae and its roots go all the way back to the original 1908 New York to Paris Great Race and we've been 32 years uh, paying tribute to that original event. The first great race event took place in 1983 as the vision of Tom McRae and Norman Miller. There were 69 auto enthusiasts in pre-World War II cars who showed up near Los Angeles for the inaugural great race. The course traveled over 2,000 miles from California to Indianapolis, ending inside the Indianapolis Motor Speedway with a well-deserved victory lap. After 31 years, this year's great race begins in Ogunquit, Maine. Well, we're here in Ogunquit, Maine for the 31st year of the great race. Old car race across the country each year. Cars dating back, the oldest car we have is a 1915 Hudson. He's trying for the third time to finish the great race for the first time. From uh, Newtown, Connecticut, Frank Boyano and his 1915 uh, Hudson Speedster, it's an Indianapolis 500 race car. We've got everything in between 1915 Hudson and uh, 1972. We've got uh, several 65 Mustangs. We've got 50s cars and 60s cars. We've got mostly pre-war cars. Just a little bit of everything uh, for people to see on this, on this great race. This is a rally. It's not a test of the top speed. It's a test of the driver and navigator working as a team to follow a precise course instruction and their car's ability to endure the cross-country trip. Great Race is a time speed endurance rally, and drivers, man, they are really taxed. The drivers have to, to break the same way time and time again, to accelerate the same speed to the same amount of time. It's a taxing event for drivers. The Great Race accepts vehicles from 1972 and older. So if you have that vintage vehicle in your garage that uh, you've been saving up since you were a child, get it out, get it running, and bring it on to the Great Race. Cars take the trip with no odometer, GPS, or cell phone. All they have is a speedo, stopwatch, and instructions. This is why the navigator is so important and must be good at directions and math. Each day, the teams are given a set of course instructions that lay out every turn, speed, and set of different checkpoints along the race course. The objective is to arrive at each checkpoint at the correct time, not the fastest. Each day, teams go through multiple checkpoints, and at the end of the day, they're given their scores. Now, we know exactly what time they should be at those checkpoints, and they're penalized one second for every second they are either early or late. Their scores then totaled up, and like golf, the lowest score wins. Now that we know the rules, we've seen the cars, let's take a look at this year's route. It's a north to south run starting in Ogunquit, Maine and ending in the Villages, Florida. Over 2,000 miles and 13 states in nine days. It's an epic adventure for the cars and participants across the scenic back roads of North America. One of the things that we make sure we do is we have a tech inspection prior to letting the participants out on the race. 
and we do that primarily for safety, but also to help them make sure that their cars can be reliable throughout the entire race. We're back. This morning we're having all the cars come in. We have to make sure all the brake lights work and their headlights work and that they have a fire extinguisher. And then we put the decals on the car, their car number, and then all of our sponsored decals. Brake lights. First day of 2014 great race. Transmission trophies. With repairs being made and the tech inspections wrapping up, race day is here as the teams start to gather at the starting line and so do thousands of fans waiting to wish these cars safe travels. One of the coolest things about the great race is watching cars that should be sitting in a museum somewhere hit the open road. It's exciting, you know, this is the kind of thing that you want everyone to be involved in to understand that cars are meant not to be just displayed and loved and talked about what they're valued at. This is when you want to get out and drive them on the road and really have some fun with them. Coach Retire's involvement in the great race is one of passion. We get to participate in a race that goes across the United States to small towns everywhere. And at each of those small towns, it draws car collectors in from hundreds of miles away, not only to see cars on display, but actually see them rolling. Two teams that have their own battle for bragging rights are the Haggerty teams. The men's team will be piloting one of the oldest cars in the great race. This 1917 Peerless Speedster, nicknamed Green Dragon. This car is no stranger to the great race, with more than 70,000 great race miles put on this car since it entered its first rally in the 1990s. The girls team brings a 1964 and a half Mustang ready to make its first run. Old versus new, who will win? Celebrating the 50th anniversary, the car has been restored by our employees, about 100 of them back in Traverse City, and we are excited to get out on the road for the great race. The beginning is here. The cars are lined up and ready to go. Now each car will go off at one minute intervals with a lunch stop in Rochester before they reach the final day one checkpoint of Lowell, Massachusetts tonight. Let's drop the flag and get this rally started. Come and go with us. We're going to Florida on the great race. The 2014 Hemmings Motor News Great Race presented by Haggerty is underway as teams leave the starting line in Algonquin, Maine and head to their first lunch stop in Rochester. Each morning teams are given a precise starting time and a starting location and they have to be at that location on time and leave when they're scheduled to go so that they can start the theme of staying on time and staying on course all day long. Once the cars were on display for an hour in Rochester, they were back on the road headed to Lowell, Mass for the day's final checkpoint. Along the way were scenic roads and antique churches. But remember, this is still a rally at heart and some teams were making sure these turns wouldn't slow them down. Literally thousands of spectators are on hand to greet the drivers as they cross the evening checkpoint in Lowell, Mass. What a crowd. Isn't it something? I've never seen a turnout like this. It's great. Unbelievable. Everybody out there needs to get an old car and enter this race. One legend in the racing world making his rookie debut in the great race is Humpy Wheeler. Humpy's 1953 Hudson was built as a replica of the character Doc Hudson in the Pixar movie Cars. I was something else. You know, this is really challenging. People think, well, gee, it's not all out. It's not like Charlotte Motor Speedway or Daytona or somewhere like that, but it's just as challenging. I defy anybody. You mean I got to go 20? Yeah, you end up going to 25 the next one, and you got to hold it that way you know, for the next 15 miles. So it separates the, the girls from the boys, I'll tell you that. It wasn't all good times for every team. John Corey's 32 Buick snapped an axle last night, and after they drove five hours to get a new axle, had to bring out a backup car. But they made it to the first checkpoint, and that's all that matters. Oh my gosh, what a, what a start to the race. You know, they say that the finish is to win. For us to get started would be half decent. The 2005 Grand Champion Greg Cunningham and his father Vernon are used to being at the front of the pack in their 1932 Ford pickup. But word was spreading fast that another team had the lead after day one. It went pretty good for us. We got a single digit day. It was a hard day of rallying. 
but it didn't take long to hear about what the first place team, the best score of the day was, was the zero for the whole day. We heard that as soon as we turned the corner into Lowell. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> That's an awesome good day. good for them. That's what, it's never been done. Irene and Barry have just posted the first ever in the history of the great race perfect score for McDowell. The pre-race favorites, Irene and Barry Jason, in their 1966 Ford Mustang, are looking for their third championship in a row. In the rally's long history, a post-war car has never claimed the overall win, in part due to tougher scoring on newer cars. Perfect is a tough score to beat. Looks like they're out to change history. A perfect score is passing the checkpoint at exactly zero. That's called an ace. Everyone wants an ace. I can't believe that. I can't believe that. 140 miles of the 2,400 miles is in the books, and there is still a zero atop the leaderboard. Plenty of excitement on day one of the 2014 Hemmings Motor News Great Race, presented by Haggerty. After the break, we'll continue the journey south. Next stop, Poughkeepsie, New York. It's the morning of day two of the 2014 Hemmings Motor News Great Race presented by Haggerty. The drivers have already made their way south, starting in Algonquin, Maine, and ending day one in Lowell, Massachusetts. One team did it in a perfect time, a great race first, but the second place team of Jeff and Eric Ferdet are only 3.26 seconds behind in their 1933 Ford pickup. It's really anyone's race, as the drivers have their eyes set on day two's final checkpoint, Poughkeepsie, New York. The one thing blocking their view is the Northeast Mountains. An ex-cup team from McPherson College has some early morning tweaks to their 312 Y-block engine, while Humpy Wheeler's grandson, Austin Hardy, goes over today's race route. After some highway driving to start the day, the views get a lot more scenic and a lot more rustic. Rivers and nostalgic wood-covered bridges. One sight worth taking in is Hemmings Motor News old-fashioned gas station. One General Lee even used this opportunity to top off some fluids. Second jump of that 75-footer. We did the 50-footer, no problem, nothing broke. It's perfect. Hit the 75-footer, lost a little brake fluid, figure we better top her off. The men's Haggerty team have their green dragon on the open road, while the women lose a little bit of time trying to find their way. Every second counts in the great race. The great racers are starting to cross the line at the day two lunch stop in Bennington, Vermont, and Jeff Ferdet has felt everything the roads had to give his 1933 pickup. I think we should go down at some of them roads though again because we missed a couple of the holes. There's a few more we need to go back and hit. <laughs> Crossing over into New York, the drivers finished the last 100 miles of the day and hit the final checkpoint. Scenic Poughkeepsie, New York, nestled right along the Hudson River. This is beautiful country, you know what? I just said to my husband, if I have anything to tell anyone, if you're not going on the great race, get off the interstate. It is beautiful, it's absolutely beautiful. Day two proved to be a tough one for the defending grand champion team who were off their perfect pace set on day one and now find themselves over 13 seconds behind a new leader. Really a tough course. The, the first leg today, the roads were very rough. Um, the car was, the truck was literally all over the road. You know, it was all I could do. You know, the, the Speedo was doing this and so was my eyes. So I, <laughs> it was hard to keep up with it. Great job today, 112 right, off. Third. It's down almost, a, that's over a whole minute off today. Thanks to this guy doing that's all the driving. Fantastic, he's a navigator. The sun has continued to shine on the first two days of the great race, but will day three prove to be as kind? You won't want to miss the trip as the 2014 Hemmings Motor News Great Race presented by Haggerty returns after the break. It's day three on the 2014 Hemmings Motor News Great Race presented by Haggerty. And teams are making last minute adjustments to the cars before making their way almost 200 miles south 
to this evening's checkpoint in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. One battle to watch is the Haggerty girls versus the Haggerty boys. After day three, the girls are ahead in the overall standings. We're feeling really good at this point. I mean, there's definitely room for improvement, but hey, we're uh, on the first page of the results, so that's a good thing. Jonathan Klinger of the Haggerty boys team is not feeling as confident. Well, if it doesn't get any worse, we'll be fine today. But if we completely blow through an exhaust manifold gasket, the car will technically still run, but you risk doing further damage if you drive it hard like that before fixing it properly. We don't want to do that. The first checkpoint of the day for the drivers is the small town of East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, home of only 12,000 residents. Many of them were on hand to check out the cars. This 1936 Ford police car, owned by Jim and Louise Feeney, was one of the fan favorites. Not every car was able to leave the East Stroudsburg checkpoint on their own power. Some had to get a lift from reliable carriers to the next stop to see if teams can make repairs overnight and get the cars ready for the next morning rally. 31 Ford Model A, we've been chasing the points problem, timing problem all day. Plus, uh, typical of Ford Model A's, dumping oil out the rear main seal, soak the clutch, and find, she finally gave up, uh, I don't know, on section, section 47 of the, uh, of the course. And we said, that's that. For those cars that were able to complete the rally to Valley Forge, it was a beautiful drive. Every turn more scenic than the last. Teams were even greeted by a waving American flag. There is something special about a pre-World War II car going through a wooden covered bridge that makes you stop and take notice. Some take the bridge route a little faster than others. Rolling hills, old farmhouses, the ride to the Valley Forge checkpoint has it all. Driving great race cars through the back roads of America, small town America, celebrating America and celebrating old cars. With old car people, it's what makes the great race so special. Cars started funneling into the Valley Forge checkpoint, and it became apparent pretty fast that these cars were starting to feel the wear of the road. Most teams were still upbeat, as the Haggerty girls couldn't wait to see the Haggerty boys come across the checkpoint so they could compare scores. How'd it go, guys? How'd it go today? Oh, here, uh, here we go. Given, given the arrogance that we're yeah, coming back to, <laughs> no, I'm no, guessing no. they did very well. There's, there's no aces today. No aces. So how'd you do? Aces. We, well, too, we did really we had, well. We had, did really well on two. Oh. Nice. Very good. What happened there? A little oops there, maybe. Oh, no. We were a little aggressive. Huh. You got... Nice. Uh, <laughs> look at that. Yeah. Two days. Uh, who's going to be carrying whose luggage tonight? Oh, nice. <laughs> carry your luggage. Go carry your luggage. It's better carrying luggage than new pressure plates. That is what Ed was fixing in his Speedster. The pressure plate on the clutch failed, and they were able to get the old one out and put a new one in to get ready for the next day. But the big repair of the night had to be the transmission rebuild done by Jeff and Eric Ferdet on their 33 Ford. The team currently holds the overall lead in the rally, but if they can't make this transmission repair, their trip and hopes of being grand champion are over. Everybody watch your hands. As always, a host of other team members are standing by and ready to lend a hand. Working into the late hours of the night, the transmission is back in the car. And we'll see if the car can maintain its lead tomorrow. Hey, I haven't heard a report back. It's down here. Broken parts, beautiful back roads. It's all part of the 2014 Hemmings Motor News Great Race, presented by Haggerty. It's the morning of day four in the 2014 Hemmings Motor News Great Race presented by Haggerty. And some of the teams, like Jeff and Eric Ferdet, were up all night making repairs before the start of the race. The Ferdets were able to rebuild their transmission to get the 33 Ford ready to run in time. And as you can see during the morning ride, they're not taking it any easier on this old truck. The cars are making their way through Delaware farm country before hitting their lunch checkpoint in Millsboro. Other drivers have followed the Ferdet's lead and are starting to hit the corners nice and hard too. But most of the drivers had only positive things to say about the afternoon course. Today's actually been pretty smooth. 
uh, we're from Central Florida, so it's a lot like Florida. We've been pretty relatively flat, so everything's went pretty smooth, and we saw a lot of farmland, which was cool, and uh, uh, we're close to Dover Air Force Base and saw planes coming in, and that was kind of neat out there in the country with the farmland and the crops and everything, and the planes flying overhead. Now it's off to Virginia as the drivers head through scenic and historic towns and over the beautiful waterways to day four's final checkpoint of Portsmouth. Here's a beautiful scene as a replica Bugatti drives over the wooden bridge and Humpy Wheeler and his grandson Austin Hardy get their heavy hornet to make this tight turn. Today's final destination is nestled right along the pier, making it a wonderful place to watch the cars come across the checkpoint. Once the cars are parked and rested for the day, it really turns into a great car show. It was beautiful compared to yesterday. The roads were nice and smooth, no bumps, no frost thieves, so not bad. One car you can't miss is this 1932 Auburn Speedster, driven by the wandering Troubadours team of Finland. This race car was originally built to run in the famed Indy 500, but wrecked and never made it into the field. The owners just want to make sure this car finishes the great race. We're just about to the first, uh, uh, actually the second checkpoint this morning, um, and uh, we lost the bolt to the linkage uh, for the clutch, and so our clutch went completely dead um, right at the stop sign and uh, in a safe place. And a farmer came up and asked us what was wrong, and uh, Chris showed him the bolt. He said, you have a nut to fit that? And in five minutes, one was hand-delivered. Uh, courtesy of, uh, we were somewhere in Maryland, I'm not sure exactly what the town was, but the guy helped us and uh, he made our day and I think actually we made his day. He looked pretty happy to, to do that, so it was really nice. Mechanical problems have already taken some of the cars out of the race and will eventually claim 22 of the 104 cars. In the meantime, one race that isn't close to being over is the competition between the Haggerty boys and the Haggerty girls team. Well, for us it was our best day yet. Um, you know, so we're happy with that. We want the scores to keep getting better, but uh, we, we, we beat the girls' team. They didn't get uh, turned around on directions like we did today. So Actually, we, we did, but we properly made up for them. Yeah, well, we, we were a few <laughs> minutes more than that. So yeah. that is, if we're, if we're actually keeping score between us. Good race scores and even 21st birthdays were celebrated in Portsmouth. But for now, this ship has sailed on the day four checkpoint. And in the morning, the remaining cars will head south to New Bern, North Carolina, as the trip from Maine to Florida continues on the 2014 Hemmings Motor News Great Race, presented by Haggerty. It's day five of the 2014 Hemmings Motor News Great Race presented by Haggerty. And the teams are up early getting their cars ready to go. The teams say goodbye to this seaside town and make their way south for a lunch stop in Elizabeth City before finishing the day in New Bern, North Carolina. Each team has its own unique way of preparing for the race day and their own system for navigating the cars. You know, it takes two people to make a great race team, a driver and a navigator. The driver has to drive the correct speeds all day long, and the navigator has to find all of the signs and tell the driver exactly what uh, speed to drive. So it's a, it is a team effort, and uh, you throw the car in as part of that team too, because it's, it doesn't matter how good you are, if the car breaks down and you're on the side of the road, it, it, you're not gonna get a good score. This race is a, a one of constant adjustment, as all races are. Adjustment in how you drive the car, adjustment in what you do to the car, adjustment into the brain of the driver, and adjustment into the brain, particularly, of the navigator, who determines what really, whether you win or lose. The navigator is such a big part of this. Drivers see a lot of tobacco and cotton fields as they make their way through the back roads of North Carolina. For the first time on the race course, the storms start to threaten the race, but things clear up for the afternoon stop in Elizabeth City. Situated along the Pascatank River, Elizabeth City welcomes the drivers to town. Just as the drivers are settling into Elizabeth City, it's time to leave for New Bern. On the way, the camera guy gets a thumbs up from the Cunninghams in their 32 Ford pickup, 
The jets outside of Virginia Beach are a cool sight for the drivers, and this drawbridge slows down cars a little bit, but it's worth the hold up to see this old bridge in motion. Some bridges that connect these waterways are more permanent, but the views are just as nice. As the vehicles near the checkpoint, the scenic waterfront gives way to a beautiful canopy of trees and white picket fences before ultimately leading to the final destination of the day. Crowds line downtown New Bern to catch a piece of rolling history in a town whose own heritage is tied to another American icon. In this old pharmacy, Caleb Bradham created the iconic Pepsi drink, originally named Brad's Drink after the founder. Besides Pepsi, the one thing drivers find a lot of in New Bern are aces. <laughs> Yay! High five, honey. <laughs> wow. Got a good hey. one. Yeah. First one. First one. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's right. I'm so happy. Finally. With seven checkpoints along the rally course today, it's been a long haul for the drivers, but the scores and the weather are looking pretty good. An ace on the first leg and a bunch of almost after that. Had a one, a three, and a one, and then a two after the time delay, and then another two. And then we doubled it up. We got a nine on the last leg, so we ended up with an 18. We find the Haggerty boys team revealing their scores to each other for the first time, and they look happy. A two, sweet. 13, we could throw that, we could stand throwing that. This is now a six. Sweet. A one, a one, a four. Awesome. <laughs> How about that? That means the restart was good. You got it. <laughs> It was a fun day for most of the riders. This former military vehicle owned by Bill and Sharon Herman is a 1952 GMC five ton coming across the finish line in New Bern. Crews start to polish off their vehicles for tomorrow's ride to Wilmington, North Carolina. Meanwhile, the streets of New Bern will fill with people as they take in this circus of pre-1972 cars until it packs up and moves on in the morning. After the break, we'll see the Barney Fife Mobile make a splash, complete with its own soundtrack. And the splashes continue as many of the riders see rain for the first time on the course when the 2014 Hemmings Motor News Great Race presented by Haggerty returns. It's early in the morning on day six as drivers go over their notes for the 100 mile ride south to Wilmington, North Carolina. Their first stop will be Clinton this afternoon. That is, if the cars can find Clinton. It may look like cars are getting lost with some taking left-hand turns at the stop sign and some going right. But that's just because when the checkpoints are set up in smaller sections like this, the course will actually overlap a little bit. That's so the cars cover more distance and it adds a little confusion to the driver, making for a tougher rally. Not everybody finds their way the first time. Sometimes you have to back it up and try it again. But this rally is really starting to turn into a race as drivers head for the lunch checkpoint. One driver who is familiar with the North Carolina heat is Humpy Wheeler. We're hitting here about 96 or 7 degrees, but uh, we're rolling along and uh, this uh, event continues to be a challenge, and the heat's just uh, another challenge. And that's kind of the reason I like this, this thing, because it is very difficult. One of the most noteworthy rookie entry teams was Guillermo Wham of Miami and his driver, Toshi Haru of Japan. With their right-hand drive 1970 Nissan Laurel, Toshi has won the hearts of everyone in the great race, and the team even took an ace at the end of day five. Another with their first ace on day five was the X-Cup team of McPherson College. Their perfect score on one of the checkpoints yesterday has given them confidence to keep moving forward in the race. Yesterday we had a great day. We got an ace for the day. Yeah, so yeah. First one was out of the car, so, um, And today so far we've been doing pretty good. We're getting a little sideways in the turns and uh, I don't know. We got our Canadian driver. You ought to be a sled driver, so. Uh, no mistakes. No mistakes. Uh, not a good day. As drivers readied their cars to head an hour and a half away to tonight's final checkpoint of Wilmington, the wandering troubadours in their 1932 Auburn Speedster realized they might need to take it easy at the lunch spots. If I eat one more fried piece of fried chicken, I'm not going to fit in this seat, I can tell you that much. 
Chris has already exceeded his fried chicken limit, so now we have them on beans only. <laughs> Chris. In case you run out of gas. It's an open cockpit car, so it doesn't bother me a bit. <laughs> now it's off to Wilmington through the back roads of America. One scenic turn happens in front of J.W. Merritt's Grocery, established in 1919. You may not find any gas on hand during this rally, but it makes for a good backdrop. For many drivers, the heat, not the direction, is the biggest battle of the day. And the rally only takes them further south, closer to the equator. The racing in this rally starts to pick up. The Wilmington checkpoint is getting closer with every turn. As cars begin to cross the checkpoint at Wilmington, you can see they have run into their first rainstorms of the rally. For some, it was a nice cool down to a hot day. And when the sun comes back out, the streets of Wilmington are flooded with onlookers checking out these special cars. This 1931 Auburn Boattail Speedster had its best day of the rally so far. I think we got about $100,000 in those. Another team that saved their best day for the race to Wilmington is the Haggerty Boys. We are very, very happy with today's score. Got an ace, and all of those are single digits. So this is a, this is a day with a lot of uh, legs in it, and we like that. Aces are important to most of the drivers, but they're even more special to rookie class drivers. This is our first, first rally. Our We've first never rallied. Rally I didn't know how to spell rally until I got here. <laughs> our I've first never done this. Oh my god. Unbelievable. I'm one of the roughest days. <laughs> this is insane. You would not believe the hacking we had to do. <laughs> this is unbelievable. I, I got it. I got it. You just navigator did it. <laughs> Not only is the Wilmington checkpoint full of fans, it's also host to helicopters overhead and warships standing guard in the harbor. The sun didn't shine on everyone's day. Some teams found that missing one sign or turn hurt their chances of a good score. The day was a wonderful day. We got an ace. We screwed up royally on one turn uh, and got a very, very bad score for one segment, but the rest of it was a glorious day. And I'm glad to be in North Carolina. What a beautiful place. And the people are great. And thank you, Lord, for letting us live another day. Every level of the great race has different rules, one of which is that the title of grand champion is saved for teams who have previously won the great race. In the great race, the grand championship division is allowed to throw three legs of the first seven stages, your three works. So today we're going to throw our bad leg and pick up one from earlier in the race but nobody can throw a leg on the last two stages, which is called the championship run. That's do or die. The championship run is not far away from Wilmington, North Carolina, and the drivers set their sights on Mount Pleasant in the morning as we close day six of the 2014 Hemmings Motor News Great Race presented by Haggerty. It's the beginning of day seven on the 2014 Hemmings Motor News Great Race presented by Haggerty. As the drivers prepare their cars to leave North Carolina and head south, almost 100 miles to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina for the afternoon lunch stop. The vehicles hit the open highway in the morning, covering some miles pretty fast. Once the cars get off the highway, it's a much prettier backdrop for Daniel Job and David Pruitt in their 1946 Cadillac Series convertible. With the Indy 500 car on the outside making the pass, it's a fun morning on the open road. Scott Mallory Henderson from Mobile, Alabama hit this corner hard in their 1965 Ford Mustang. The rally is starting to heat up. Kenneth Creary almost misses the turn in his 1965 Ford Ranchero, but he backs it up and tries it again. Lots of great driving already in the morning of day seven, which takes us to our first checkpoint at Myrtle Beach. I'm pretty sure this Bugatti replica had two headlights when the rally started a week ago. The Haggerty girls team gives us the feeling for the morning ride. Long, really, really long and hot, but hopefully good. A long morning makes for even a longer afternoon. Don't forget hot, too. It's going well. I think I'm pretty well done. I think, I think like the butterball turkey, I think my thing has popped out. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty good shape right now. So bring the dressing and the cranberry juice and let's eat. Least of all, this 1915 Hudson 640. 
As the oldest car in the race, this century-old classic has been pushed to its limits by its driver, Frank Bonanno. The drivers finally reached their destination for the day, Mount Pleasant. It's the home of Patriots Point and the USS Yorktown, which is where the drivers will have their dinner tonight. With only four checkpoints on the day, the drivers had an opportunity to make up some significant time on the road. Two teams who came in back to back after battling neck and neck through the first seven days are the Haggerty Boys and Girls teams. As they park their cars for the first time today, let's get their scores. We're not as good as what the guys look like they're doing. Yeah, the guys look pretty happy. We're not so much. They yeah. were long hauls. They were, I, well, the leg that we got 18 seconds on, there was it was a pretty long one between checkpoints and a whole lot going on in between. But yeah. I mean, we didn't, we thought we might be off a little bit, but not 18 seconds. So. No, not 18 seconds. Seven, seven seconds. We did a little bit. <laughs> yeah, we'll take this. Knocked it. Today was a driver's day. <laughs> Eric and Jeff Fredette had the overall lead coming into day seven in their 1933 Ford truck with a giant American flag, but it doesn't look like they were able to hold on to it. We were in first. I don't think we'll be there now. Nope. Unless the, unless the guys in second made a big boo-boo. <laughs> but they don't seem to be making any boo-boo, so. Uh, nope. Right. Now we got two more days of fun left. The new current leaders, Irene and Barry Chasen, make some final tweaks on the Mustang. Most cars will live on to race another day. However, the wandering troubadours of Finland end their great race a few days too soon. We lost a rod bearing probably about 20, 25 miles ago and nursed it in to uh, the stop here because uh, to be finished is to win. And uh, we're finished, so we won. <laughs> Just uh, as far as John Class is concerned, we probably didn't. They're probably not going to give us the check. They can mail the check, though. Well, they can mail us. They'll find us. And so I think what we're going to do is we're going to stay in Charleston and enjoy ourselves. I just want to say we're proud of this team. <laughs> We've been running hard. Bring it on in. The drivers head to the warship for a tour and evening activities. But with the final and most important two days of the race on the horizon, the pressure is on. All checkpoints count, meaning no scores can be thrown out in the championship run. It's day eight on the 2014 Hemmings Motor News Great Race presented by Haggerty. And the cars are heading south for the lunch stop in Savannah, Georgia, before they hit the final checkpoint tonight in Jacksonville, Florida. The cars start to line up on beautiful River Street. It's unique to see real brick pavement under these classic cars. The streets are flooded with tourists taking a look at this impromptu car show along the Savannah River before the teams leave town as quick as they came. The race is on again as the cars journey south toward the Jacksonville checkpoint. You can see how scores are tallied during the rally. A spotter is set up at each rolling checkpoint to calibrate time. The Florida sun is in full force today. You can see the steam coming off the highway. Luckily, the old Spanish moss helps to shade the cars for a few turns. Day eight comes to a close at the Jacksonville landing off Laura Street. Not everyone wants to know the final score going into the last day, and drivers also know they can't throw out any scores from this championship run. The Haggerty girls come into the checkpoint shaking their heads. A roadside repair cost them a lot of precious time today. We uh, had a, a fuel pump go on us after the first leg of the calibration this morning. So we were down and out for, for a long, long while. Had to convert it over to an electric fuel pump on the fly. So um, we came in under our own power, though. So that's the good point. Not everyone ran into car troubles today. The two-time champs had a smooth day, and there is a tight race for the top spot in the Grand Champion Division. We did pretty well until the last leg, and then we got caught up in not communicating real well, and it, but it worked out okay. It was three late. It could have been worse. <laughs> and, you got, and you got an ace. We got an ace, so that's good, but we don't know if that's good enough to get us close. <laughs> have to find the Fredette. The Jasons will find out by the time they leave Jacksonville tomorrow morning that during the sprint to the finish, they led the Fredettes by only half a second. We'll crown a great race champion after the break.
We're on the final leg of the 2014 Hemmings Motor News Great Race, presented by Haggerty. Teams will head south through the state of Florida, starting in Jacksonville and finishing in the villages outside of Ocala. Only half a second separates the first and second place teams for that $50,000 grand champion check. So there is a lot at stake on the road today. Nerves are high. Today would be known as white knuckle day. Hands on the wheel, pay attention. Yeah. After rebuilding the transmission on day three, the Fredette Racing Team finds itself in second place, just half a second behind the reigning two-time champions. It's like uh, right about a half a second. It's been like that for two days now. So except for yesterday, we were half a second ahead. Today, we were half a second below. So. It's, it's close enough that it, you know, it can go either way right now. It's a coin toss, basically. So. The first place team feels like consistency has been their key all week, and they hope to get the same type of consistency in the final leg of the race. We've just been pretty consistent, uh, so there really haven't been that many ups and downs. Uh, there's been several teams that have been real consistent, so we're real close at this point. There's probably four or five teams that uh, any one of them could be in first place at the end of the day. And they're off. Today is only a half day of racing, but the drivers will make a pit stop in Ocala, Florida before heading to the final checkpoint in the villages. Vernon and Greg Cunningham hit this straightaway line with palm trees. They will eventually finish the race 13th overall. Right behind them is the Ferdette team in their 33 Ford pickup trying to make up that half a second and catch first place. And here come the leaders in their 66 Ford Mustang. They seem to be keeping pace with everyone else. It's interesting watching the Navigator keeping track of every second with the stopwatch, even knowing how long to stay at each stop sign. That is some real precision racing. Now the cars start to roll through the Ocala checkpoint at the National Parts Depot headquarters, and the teams start going over notes to see how close the standings really are. The leading team is not sure where they stand yet. We had a good day, but obviously that doesn't much matter. You know, we got to uh, I'm hooking the fuel pump that we installed yesterday <laughs> on the fly. We've had a lot of fun on the rally. Um, it's been a great adventure. I hope that we're back doing it again next year. Me too. We need redemption. Yeah, yeah we do. <laughs> With an extra fuel pump in the trunk. 30 miles to go, and the vehicles reach the final checkpoint in the Villages, Florida. After nine days of rallying and over 2,400 miles on the back roads of America, the Villages is one of Florida's friendliest retirement communities, and it shows from the greeting these cars get as they come down Main Street. Humpy Wheeler comes across the finish line in his Doc Hudson replica from the movie Cars. Humpy finished 68th in his first ever great race, but he learned a lot about rally style racing. It's been quite an experience uh, to say the least. It's been challenging, it's been eventful. We went through every kind of back country there was, you know, from <laughs> Maine to, to Florida. But it was our first experience, and so uh, we gained a lot, a lot, a lot of knowledge about uh, rallying this time. The Haggerty boys team of Jonathan Klinger and Devin Reckow take home second place in the sportsman division and 12th place overall in their 1917 Peerless, and with it, a check for $5,000, not to mention bragging rights over the girls team until next year's great race. They should thank us for um, lighting the fire uh, to get them in gear to win the money that they won today. That's right. I think we should split it. I think so. Or maybe they better take us out for a really nice dinner. <laughs> the X Cup, or student champs, came from McPherson College. The team won the division for the second straight year and plans on defending their crown again next year. Even though Beth Gentry and Jody Knowles had one of the top scores from Jacksonville to the Villages, it just wasn't enough to catch the second place team. But they still go home with a check for almost $10,000. That's what I was always hoping for today, so I'm very happy. The Fredette Racing Team comes across the finish line six seconds behind the first place team, sealing a second place finish overall. But they still finish first in the expert division which gives them a prize money total of $15,000, a great finish. 
They had to overcome major repairs along the way, even at the finish line. Something in our drive chain just broke right there at the finish line. So, you know, that's what they say about building something good. As long as it breaks right at the finish line, you got as much power out of it as you possibly could. And your overall grand champion of the rally for the unprecedented third year in a row is Irene and Barry Jason in their 1966 Ford Mustang, the first ever post-war car to win the great race overall championship. For their efforts, the couple takes home a check for $50,000. As the oldest car, a 1915 Hudson finishes the great race for the first time, and many rookies complete their first great race. They remind us that this event is all about finishing, even if you need to push your car across the final checkpoint. It's also about picking the right car and having the right teammate to get you 2,400 miles through 19 cities in nine days. Coming across that finish line is really the only trophy most people need. The 2014 Hemmings Motor News Great Race presented by Haggerty is in the books. Next year's journey will take these cars on the famous Route 66 from Missouri to California. You won't want to miss it.